Welcome to session one in my All About Bees Queen Rearing and Selection video collection. I retired as a commercial beekeeper in 2020 and I was running 150 hives on the Murray Coast in Scotland and working on my own I raised about 100 queens a year and sold about 50 nukes and that's not bad for Northern Scotland. Many beekeepers are reluctant to raise their own queens but it really should be part of any serious beekeepers arsenal. And over this series, I intend to show you how to do just that. Session one is an introduction to queen rearing. I will cover the differences between queen rearing and queen breeding, stock selection criteria and general queen rearing principles. If you are enjoying these videos, please click the like and subscribe buttons below, especially if you don't want to miss out on any new video releases. And I also welcome comments and questions. Why would you need a source of young mated queens? Well, the most obvious reason is to replace an old and or failing queen. And you can't be sentimental with this. You need to be able to cull queens if you're going to be a successful beekeeper. The easiest and quickest way to do this is to pick her up by her wings and squish her head between finger and thumb. If you are squeamish, then if you catch her in a queen cage, you can place the cage in the freezer overnight and that will also do the deed. I generally never kept a queen older than two years old and would either replace them myself or the bees would do so as part of the swarming or supersedure process. An old queen won't be producing as much queen substance as a younger queen and this could lead to the colony going into swarming mode earlier, thus affecting their honey production. A failing queen will not be a prolific layer and won't be as fecund as a newly mated queen and could be running out of sperm so she too will need replacing. Any queenless colonies can easily be requeened re if you've got some spare queens yourself. If you overwinter some nukes with a current year's queen, you can unite this nuke to any colony that has a drone laying queen in spring. Make sure you remove the drone layer first. If you are making increase or selling nukes, you can use one of your own young mated queens, thus increasing your profit margin. Young mated queens will help with swarm prevention and control as well. Some bee farmers I know introduce new queens to their colonies in spring, as it has been shown that colonies headed by a young current year queen are unlikely to swarm again that year, as long as they are given space in the super and brood nest. You can also replace the queen of a colony showing signs of trying to swarm with a young queen, as again it will be unlikely to try and swarm again that season. If you introduce a young queen to a colony that has just swarmed, the colony will be back into production much sooner than if it had to wait for the daughter queen to emerge from a queen cell, mate and begin laying, because that could take anything between three and six weeks. I used to replace some queens of colonies going to the heather with a current year's queen. You see, old queens tend to stop laying on the moors and may not start laying when they return. The colony then goes into winter with a small cluster of old workers, reducing its survival chances. Young queens continue to lay, enabling you to winter a large colony of younger bees, ready to get going the following spring. If you rear your own queens, they will be locally adapted to your area, and thus likely to perform better in terms of laying rate and also honey production. You also reduce the risk of importing disease into your apiary from purchased queens. You can select for characteristics to suit your area and your style of beekeeping management. Bought-in queens are expensive, so rearing your own is cheaper than buying them, and you will improve your beekeeping skill, and queen rearing is great fun. I would recommend that everyone has a go. So, rear your own queens and don't buy them off the internet. I want to ask you a question. What's the difference between queen rearing and queen breeding? Well, queen breeding is more involved, and you as the beekeeper are more proactive. You make the decisions, not the bees. Queen breeding involves keeping records, selecting for good characteristics and propagating queens from that best stock. You decide on the characters you favour and keep records to identify those colonies that possess all or most of them. Produce daughter queens from the breeder queen and use them to replace queens in colonies with undesirable characteristics. 
It can take up to three years of records to properly identify a potential brooder queen. Bear in mind that drones are important in the, in the process, so you want your desirable colonies to produce lots of drones. In this exercise, we're going to look at some scenarios. I want you to start thinking about what you would criteria you would select. Number one, in the east of England, where lots of autumn-sown oilseed rapers grow, what criteria would you want in your bees? Well, you'd want colonies that overwinter well, wouldn't you? For cun queens that produce big colonies. Colonies that build up quickly in spring to be able to take advantage of the oilseed rape. And colonies that collect lots of honey. And also maybe non-swarmy bees so that they don't go into swarming mode until the flow finishes. What about number two? In the highlands of Scotland where spring is late, sometimes the end of May and into June in some parts. Well, again, we want them to overwinter well on minimum brood. We want them to delay raising brood in spring. And the local black bee fits the bill here. How about for an apiary in an urban setting with close neighbours? Well, the safety of the public is most important here. So you want good tempered bees that don't sting all the time. Non followers with a low swarming tendency. And finally, number four. For bees going to pollinate apples in spring, well, again, you would want bees that came out of winter strong and build up fast. Bees that fly at low temperatures and collect lots of pollen. So there you've got four examples of selecting for different criteria. And I hope it's got you thinking more about the type of bees you want. So here are some selection criteria that I, I use. Calmness, still on the comb. Disease resistance, overwintering success, fecundity, which actually means large colonies, productivity, especially in honey production, low swarming tendency, and also you may have some local projects, e.g. you might have a preference for AMM bees or bookfast bees or whatever. So temperament and productivity are linked. If the bees are calm, you can go through a colony for far more quickly than a bad tempered one. And the colony that, that produces lots of honey is always a criteria of mine. Needless to say, the healthy colonies that are disease and parasite resistant are also very important. Some bees, actually it was the black mongrel bees up where I kept mine, were prone to choke brood, so I would never breed from these. Some bees, Italians for example, have a reputation of consuming stores well into winter as they continue to raise brood. And this isn't desirable in the UK. I once had some queens from Cyprus. They were known as the super bee. And while they did produce masses of massive colonies in summer, this continued into autumn and early winter, which resulted in their eventual demise of all of them. They just didn't stop raising brood. Non swarmy bees are also important for me and probably for you. Swarm control and collecting swarms is labor and time intensive. If a colony swarms, the loss of forages means less honey for you. And finally, bees that are steady on the comb are a pleasure to work with, as opposed to some of them that run about at 100 miles an hour, making finding the queen and general inspections very difficult. Let's look at the general principles in queen rearing and selection. You need to keep accurate records and then come up with a plan, for example, which colony has the right characteristics to breed from? You need to identify the breeder queen or queens. Which colonies are you going to use as cell raisers? These are the colonies into which you introduce the young larva from the breeder queen. So they, they get converted into queens. What method are you going to use to introduce the larvae? And how are you going to get the queens mated? To put it in a nutshell, you produce daughter queens from the breeder queens and use them to replace queens in colonies with undesirable characteristics. Now I want to talk to you about polyandry and no, she isn't one of my beekeeping girlfriends. Polyandry is a pattern of mating in which a female animal or insect has more than one male mate and this is the case with honeybees. Generally speaking, queens mate with between 12 and 14 drones. Drones need to be at least 12 days old to be sexually mature. 
Drones should ideally come from unrelated but equally good genetic stock to avoid inbreeding and the diploid drone problem. Controlling which drones a queen's mate with is difficult, but two methods are available. Artificial insemination is the first one, but this is beyond the resources or skills of most beekeepers, or flooding and culling in which you cull the drones from undesirable colonies using a drone trap which prevents the drones from flying and you add drone comb to desirable colonies to get more desirable drones produced. So selection of the drone line is as important as selection of the queen line. However, we still rely upon mating on the wing so there is still a chance element. I'll cover this in a later session, but bear in mind that for over and control is very important. We are promoting drone raising, which might accelerate mite population growth, so keep monitoring your bees. During mating flights, queens fly between 200 metres and 2 kilometres, and drones fly between 500 metres and 5 kilometres, according to Winston in Biology of the Honeybee. And this prevents inbreeding and promotes genetic diversity. It means that drones from neighbouring apiaries are likely to mate with your queens. Tom Celia writes in his new book, Regarding flight distances, it is clear that queens and drones will fly great distances to reach drone congregation areas, with queens mating on average 2-3 to three kilometres from their nest, and drones travelling up to 5 or 7 kilometres to find a sexually receptive queen. Winston says that most studies suggest that virgin queens usually fly two to three kilometers on mating flights, but there is some disagreement about average distance that drones fly, with some studies stating greater than two kilometers, while others stating less. To be successful in your queen rearing operation, you need the collective gene pool of dozens of colonies. So, it is a good idea if you can form a breeding group with neighbouring beekeepers. It is essential that you all agree on the features you are selecting for though. You may not have any colonies with any desirable traits worth propagating, but other members might have. Or you can buy in from a breeder of quality stock. Some of the Bookfast breeder queens from Denmark I used to look at cost hundreds and hundreds of pounds, so it was very expensive. What exactly is a good quality queen? Well, the best queens are fed royal jelly from egg hatching, i.e. they were destined to become a queen from the start. Royal jelly contains nutrients that activate the queen genes. But remember that a two and even a three day old larvae transferred from a worker to a queen cell will develop into a queen. After three days though, queen like workers or worker like queens are produced, what we call scrub queens. And after four days, the cast is fully determined and can't be changed. General queen rearing principles. You need a low level or no queen substance in the colony as these pheromones suppress queen rearing. You can also force a supersedia situation in which the bees raise queen cells even if the queen is still present and we'll look at that later. You need a crowded condition of the brood nest and an overabundance of nurse bees to create the production of royal jelly. You need a good supply of pollen the protein source needed by the nurse bees to produce the royal jelly and either a heavy nectar flow or feed syrup to stimulate the comb cell builders. And finally, the presence of selected one or two day old larvae, ideally presented in downward pointing cells, will complete the setup. And I've already stressed the importance of drones from desirable colonies. Many beekeepers requeen using naturally produced queen cells, and I wouldn't say never do this because I've done it myself, with the proviso that you don't use a bad or poor quality colony. But when beekeepers do this, they have little control over which colonies produce them, when they are produced and whereabouts on the comb they are produced, making it difficult to cut them out of the comb for distribution to mating nukes or queenless colonies later. There are three types of naturally produced queen cells, swarm cells, supersedia cells and emergency cells. Swarm cells are usually found at the top or bottom of the comb. They contain large well-fed queen larvae, but remember this queens produced from colonies trying to swarm often carry the trait for excessive swarming. These cells can be attached to the frame woodwork and get damaged if you try to detach them for distribution to mating nukes. So in this case 
it would be better to select and transfer the frame with one good sized queen cell on it. So as I said, I wouldn't rule out using naturally produced swarm cells, but who is in control of this situation? The beekeeper or the bees? Here we have three classic swarm cells that look great by the way. The two on the right can be cut out with a pair of scissors, but the one on the left is attached to the bottom bar, so you would have to transfer the whole frame if you wanted to use it. Here we can see the two on the right, easily cut out with the scissors. The one on the left is attached there, so you couldn't cut it out without damaging it. Just a note that when you always want to use sealed queen cells that on the, are on the point of emergence, i.e. about 14 days old, as these are more robust and the queen is usually well formed inside. These are emergency queen cells. They are made by the bees after the queen is lost, often killed accidentally by the beekeeper. The bees panic and start feeding larva, previously designated to become workers with royal jelly, and they will emerge as queens. Emergency queen cells are on the face of the comb and there are often many of them. Please note the bees are not in swarming mode when they make these cells, so my advice would be to leave them alone to get on with it. You could cut these out with scissors as long as you took some of the comb with each cell or transfer entire frames with one selected queen cell on. It is important that you are able to recognise queen cells and the different types, for example, swarm cells, emergency queen cells and supersedure queen cells. These in the photograph are not queen cells. They are called queen cups or play cups. The bees make them all the time. When you see them being polished inside the propolis, you know the queen will be laying in them soon, but it is only classed as a queen cell when the egg is hatched and the larva is being fed royal jelly. Queen cells can be sealed or unsealed. On the bottom of these frames, you can see two unsealed queen cells, the second and third along from the left, and three sealed queen cells. Here you can see an unsealed queen cell, first from the left, with a larva inside being fed copious amounts of royal jelly. The other two cells in the top right of the photograph are empty and look like old queen cells or old play cups. There's nothing inside them. The first from the left is a sealed queen cell and the second one is unsealed but looks like it's very close to being sealed. Here we have sealed queen cells on the bottom of the frame, probably from a double brew box colony. They're classic swarm cells and in this instance the swarm is almost certainly already gone. Now I want you to have a look at these photographs and see if you can identify what type of cells these are. One and two, number three, number four, and number five, number six here, and number seven, number eight, and finally number nine. Let's have a look at the answers then. Well, Number one is a queen cell from which a queen has previously emerged. If you look closely, you will see where the lid is opened and it's fallen off. Number two is a queen cup. Number three is an empty queen cup or old queen cell. Number four is a sealed queen cell and it is a swarmed queen cell. Number five is an emergency queen cell. Number six, a supersedure queen cell. The bees are replacing the queen and they make between one and five queen cells on the face of the comb. When you see these cells, let the bees get on with it and don't interfere. Number seven is a torn down queen cell from which the queen has been removed by the bees. They have either changed their mind about swarming or they have accepted an emerged queen and are getting rid of all the rest. Number eight is an unsealed queen cell and as it's on the bottom of the frame, it's probably a swarm cell. And the last one, number nine, is another queen cup. After you cut out queen cells, you can insert them into the gap between the top bars, like this in this nucleus. Or you can make a depression in the face of the comb and carefully sit the queen cells to the comb. 
Note, you use only one, not two queen cells. That is the end of session one, and I hope you now have an understanding of the differences between queen rearing and queen breeding, stock selection criteria, and general queen rearing principles. There are many different methods to choose from in queen rearing. In session two, I'll be showing you the Miller method, as this is something I've personally done with some success. If you are enjoying these videos, you can buy me a beer or make a donation to my PayPal account by following the links on my YouTube channel about page. Thank you to those who have already bought me a beer. Your donation will help me with the running costs. I also welcome any comments or questions and promise that I will reply to all of them. That's all for now. Adios, amigos.